I could start this story with a murder. I could start it with a plane crash. I almost started it with a book. But then I was lucky enough to have my researcher speak to a person who read the book and tried the diet. So I thought I'd start instead with an inside look. Today we will be talking about a woman who developed the Way Down Diet, founded the Remnant Fellowship Church and turned it into a cult. This is the story of Gwen Shamblin Lara. It is now 2 a.m. on a Saturday. Well, you know, Sunday really, because Saturday to Sunday. I can't sleep because um, TMI, PMSing. But uh, I love, I love the passion that I have at this moment in time to end this year on a note of a problematic woman. Last year, the last case of the year, I believe, was Heidi Fleiss, who at least had some great intentions. She just wasn't the best when it came to executing them. Gwen, Gwen is a piece of work. I don't think that Gwen truly ever even had as such as a single great intention. It was all self-fulfilling prophecy, and we're going to dive straight into that. However, even before that, this case has to come with some trigger warnings. As you might have guessed, even from the intro, one of them will be eating disorder. There's a theme of starvation and encouragement of people starving themselves. And there will be a theme of child abuse in this video. So if this is something that you don't want to listen to right now, if you're sensitive to these topics, there's plenty more on this channel where this came from or in your podcast app, wherever you're listening. And when you hear these trigger warnings, it is bizarre to even think that somebody like Gwen could even recruit anybody, like a single person. So in order to set the scene, let's start with a personal experience that we have from Jeannie, my researcher, so that you understand how Gwen would sell this to people. My researcher Jeannie has a sister who has struggled with her weight her entire grown life. She was real thin as an adolescent, but later would always seem to be dieting, even when her sister and her whole family thought that she was perfect just the way that she was. She now has her master's degree in social work and is an ordained minister. So in researching this cult and knowing this diet included religion, Jeannie reached out to her sister. And keep in mind, her sister is devout in her faith. To Jeannie's surprise, she said yes, she has tried this type of diet. She said at the time, their mother sent her the books and the CDs so that she could try them. She said she took the seminars locally. Now, Jeannie was curious to know if it had helped her. Now, Jeannie was curious to know if it had helped her, as she knew many times she had tried diets that did help. Her sister said that one did not help her. She said she believed it can work for people who are fully committed to God and the process. She also said she would want to lose the weight, but was not always willing to give up chips, bread, french fries, all the fattening stuff. She also said it was about eating only when you're hungry. And that last sentence brings us to the basic premise here. The core of what Gwen would preach was if God could deliver the Israelites from bondage and servitude, he could also deliver her from overeating. She said you have to be able to actively say no to your addiction. And that if she knows anything about addiction, she knows that controlling it is nearly impossible. She would say, and I'm quoting here, I don't care what the addiction is, prescription meds, illegal drugs, alcohol, food, or gambling. You have to maintain control over your willpower to avoid the thing that you're addicted to, or it won't work. Jeannie asked her sister if she tried asking God for the power to overcome her addiction to food, and she said, I didn't ask. Her sister said that she didn't think that at the time that she was reading the books, that she was mature enough in her spiritual walk to completely understand that was what she needed to do. When Jeannie told her a bit more about what she had actually researched and what she had recently learned about Gwen and the church that she founded, her sister was stunned. We are all born into sin and a sinful fallen world. 
But Jesus died to pay the price for that sin. And he is the only way to God slash heaven. She set herself up as an idol, which is very biblically wrong. This is directly from Jeannie's sister. Also, she commented that Gwen is the kind of person who gives Christians like her and her friends a bad name. After speaking with her sister, Jeannie also read the book, Gwen's own book. First, let me say to anyone listening, please don't read it. This is from Jeannie herself. She has read it so that you don't have to suffer. She described it as a very sick, troubled individual writing it. And it was very obvious just from how the book was written. I will tell you the ins and outs of the book, but it could be very triggering to anyone who has had to deal with anorexia, bulimia, or any kind of food or trigger-based illnesses. From beginning to end, Gwen Shambling Lara admits to and explores being both anorexic and bulimic, and she was never treated for it. This book was her treatment. I cannot believe it is a good idea for someone with such an obsession with food to write a book teaching others how to lose weight. The book is half love letter to food and half love letter to God. She later preaches that you must give up your obsession with food and replace that with your love for God. The problem is, from what Jeannie had read in the book, Gwen herself didn't. You may see pictures of Gwen in this where she gets skinnier and skinnier, and her hair grows larger and larger. It is of Jeannie's belief after reading this book that was her eating disorder. It had nothing to do with way down. By that I'm referring to Gwen getting skinnier and skinnier, not her hair growing because of the eating disorder. But according to her, it had nothing to do with the way down. It had nothing to do with this cult slash organization. Way Down is the name of the book and diet that Gwen Shambling created. She starts very early with an all-encompassing statement. Our heart and needs are fed by looking for and finding that God is our financier, comforter, mechanic, lawyer. Just pause for a second. God is your mechanic? He takes care of your finances? Like, why am I not a bowler then? Like, why Why doesn't God want the best for me in that case? It's just an odd statement. It's just an odd statement. It's just where, where does she pull this from? If not out of her own fucking ass. Another statement that she makes is, you're not a failure. It is not genetic. Now, this kind of is a slap in the face of actual sciences that to show that you are genetically predisposed to certain traits, some that cause or have a hand in your weight. Like, I just don't know how she then explains certain things like, I don't know, cancers, illnesses that are deadly, that are genetically passed. Like, you are predisposed to have certain illnesses and also have certain traits that then, for example, can cause weight gain or weight loss as well. So, for example, the thyroid. If you were to have a goiter, so like a swelling on your neck, which can be passed from one generation to the next, it greatly affects your weight and overall health. Gwen doesn't know your genetics, but she's going to tell you that she does. Also, she starts with comparing your weight loss journey with the Bible story about the journey the children of Israel took from the slavery of Egypt. She touches on this a lot, and we both, me and Jeannie, think that it's twofold. One, it can be inspiring to be compared to strong people. And the other is that she can point to those that were enslaved and say that maybe you don't have it so bad. Gwen finally starts telling us her own story in this book, saying that she wished her father had fixed her greed for food when she was young. She wouldn't have struggled her whole life if he had. Put a pin in this, because I think it is truly the core of how she will then use this as a motivator in order to discipline children later on. So let's talk a bit about Gwen. Gwen Henley was born on February the 18th, 1955 in Memphis, Tennessee. Her dad was a physician and her mom was a homemaker, so she lived a typical middle-class life. 
She did grow up in the era where parents insisted that kids clean their plates, meaning eat all the food on them. There were a couple of reasons for this. The first one was that these parents had lived through the Depression, and they were appalled at wasting food. There was also the fact that they did not have it easy to heat and eat those meals. They did not have microwaves, so you couldn't just pop your leftovers and heat them up in one of those. We now have aluminum foil, plastic wrap, plastic containers to store our leftovers, and also the microwave to heat them up quickly. Now, Gwen's family was involved in the Church of Christ when she was growing up. So we have like main influencers here, one to do with food, the other one to do with God, just as she would say in her book. The Church of Christ started in the 1800s as a Protestant church that believed that they were reforming God's one true church by living directly by scripture. These churches did not allow women as pastors or even deacons. They had no place directly in the church. They believed a woman's place was to raise the children and make a good home, obey her husband, and yes, we do mean obey. The wives were taught to ask their husbands before making any big purchases. They did not have anything to do with the family's banking that was left to the man. The marriage covenant mentions a wife having a meek and quiet spirit, submitting to her husband's will and doing nothing to displease him. Now, this is when the book gets triggering. She very openly says she would sneak downstairs after her parents went to sleep to binge on food, stuffing herself with everything she could as fast as she could. When Gwen went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville for college, she said she gained 20 pounds. She will repeatedly in this book and in the interviews any time that she is asked about her weight loss journey say that she was always 20 pounds overweight. She goes into vivid detail about how the food at college looked and how it tasted. She says she tried throwing up to purge what she had binged, but didn't have the coordination for it. Neither me nor Jeannie are sure what the hell does she mean by not having coordination for purging. She got her undergrad degree in dietetics and then her master's degree in nutrition with a focus in biochemistry. In 1978, Gwen marries David Shamblin, who she would go on to have two children with. She begins a weight loss counseling office in 1980, and this is since she had struggled with her weight so much. That same year, she gave birth to her first son, Michael, and in 1982, she gave birth to Michelle Elizabeth. They would always call her Elizabeth. The year after Elizabeth was born, Gwen got pregnant with a second boy that they were to name Matthew, but she miscarried when she was eight months pregnant. After this, she worked at the city's Department of Health for five years. In 1986, she founded Way Down and had seminars at her house. In 1992, she was hosting workshops out of her garage. She made a workbook that the members could take notes in, but also journal their daily eating. Before we go even further, because as you can see, things started picking up quite fast. So let us explain way down a little bit. Basically, it is what you might know as intuitive eating, where you wait till you feel signs of hunger, and then you eat until you're full. The difference between what we normally do in Gwen's program or just intuitive eating in general, you must learn to recognize the true signs of hunger, such as your stomach growling. Then you can eat any food, and none are off limits. You're supposed to eat what you crave. If it's a candy bar, a bowl of ice cream and tortilla chips, then that's what you will eat. However, you're supposed to eat slowly, chewing your food well, and taking your time so you will notice the beginning of a full belly. Gwen recommended setting your fork down between each bite, eating the tastiest looking bites first, and stop the moment you feel the beginnings of being full. Let's say you get to that point and you have two bites left on your plate. Then you're supposed to either save it for later, or if you're comfortable with it, throw it away. But you absolutely do not eat those last few bites, because you're supposed to be listening to your body and giving it the nourishment that it needs. 
so far that sounds reasonable but it doesn't sound groundbreaking not groundbreaking enough for the success that it had had by 1997 the weight down diet had done so well that it had spread to 30,000 weekly meetings in 70 countries and she had a set of VHS tapes as well the same year that Gwen had her diet meetings hosted by churches worldwide, she also published her first book, The Way Down, and she sold over one million copies. She went on a book tour where she taught the curriculum, signed books, and networked. This was also when the television introduced the world to Gwen. She was on Larry King Live, The Tyra Banks Show, and Good Morning America, where she talked about her book and the entire diet in general. The interesting thing I found was that there was a line from her book that she quoted verbatim on Larry King Live. Larry would ask her if she had been overweight, and she mentioned those 20 pounds. She then says, I knew no end to fullness, and I tried throwing up. The rest of the line in the book is my food after I binge, but I was not coordinated enough. What really got me was that there is an extremely popular weight loss guru who had earned over $5 million by then, and she just admitted to trying to make herself vomit up her food, and nobody's calling her out on it. She only broke off the sentence just to say more of the same, but both me and Jeannie listening to this interview kind of kept waiting for Larry to say, excuse me, did you say you tried to make yourself throw up? And did you get treatment for that? But nothing is said. It is possible that back then, the end of the 90s, maybe they weren't as aware of the signs of anorexia or bulimia. Also back then, no one would have looked at her and thought she had an eating disorder. She looked of a normal size and normal weight for her frame. And it's more recently been recognized that a person can indeed have an eating disorder and you cannot tell just by looking at them. Now, when she wrote the book, she says people that had taken her workshop and after learning about their body, they had been successful at losing weight. But she was approached by some because they couldn't keep the weight off. She says that she prayed about it and God spoke to her. He told her that people were failing to keep their weight off because they weren't devout. And that was lacking in their hearts, making them feel empty so they would eat. She does talk in the book about how she's certain that God intends for humans to be thin. Because while she had the people of every race and creed ask for her help losing weight, not once has anyone asked for her help gaining weight. Which I put in the script, why would you ask an already skinny person how to gain weight? Like, it's not like you are going into a gym and somebody is ripped and you're like, oh my god, how do I bulk up? It's like going into a candy shop to buy your vegetables. Like, you would not go and ask a skinny person, like, how do I gain weight? No, what, what is the logic in that? This tells her that being thin, the fact that she is so focused on it, is not a vanity, but what the Lord wants. She also says that in Mark 7.14, Jesus said, Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. So, as far as Gwen is concerned, no food is off limits. That would also include alcohol and tobacco. Jamie had noticed in this book that Gwen does seem to take liberties with the Bible, if you know what you're looking for. She tends to either take something completely out of context or breaks scriptures in half and glues them to other scriptures. Early in the book, she's clear on the fact that behavior modification will not work. Then, 70 pages later, she says, God is the genius of behavior modification. She's very upfront on her beliefs about water and exercise, saying that you don't need to exercise because it won't help you lose weight and it will make you very thirsty. She says that if you drink too much water, you won't be able to feel your stomach cues for hunger. She says the diet soda is not bad for you and that aspartame, which is the artificial sweetener found in diet drinks, has been investigated 26 times by the FDA and is just fine. Many times over the years, aspartame has come under fire when claims arise that it causes illnesses, including cancer. 
But most people in the diet industry will at some point tell you how aspartame is completely safe. Now, she really has beef with water, okay? She really does not like water and like, listen, girl, I get it. But you can't be saying shit like this as a nutritionist, as somebody with actual qualifications. Because she would go on to say that you absolutely do not need eight glasses of water a day. That is way too much. And explains if you drink too much, you might get sick. She is taking hypoanatremia, which is what can happen when you drink an outrageous amount of water over a short period of time. And it's extremely rare because as you're drinking water, the normal function of your kidneys takes care of that. Usually we drink a lot less water than we should be drinking, not the other way around. Usually a person has an underlying issue like kidney failure before anything like what she's saying can even happen. And this is where I put, like, she's not a doctor, right? She's barely a nutritionist and a bad one at that, if you ask me. Like, if water is the biggest of your problems, like, I don't think you are really qualified when it comes to this topic. She's trying to steer you away from water because it cannot make you feel full. She's upfront about the fact that your stomach growling or other alerts it gives is because of the lower blood sugar in your system. When looking to detect hunger signs, she says it can be a burn in your stomach or esophagus, an acid feeling underneath your ribs, and the obvious growl or rumbling. However, it is important you find it the first time, so you know what it is. So you shouldn't eat anything at all and drink only diet drinks or sip or water. She says you may have to wait a full day for that first time, but don't worry, because If you happen to miss the sign, your body will just take that meal from your hips or stomach, wherever you store fat on your body. And if you have a headache, because apparently she doesn't really want you to fucking drink water, instead of exploring the low blood sugar, she says to take a headache medicine and pray. If after 36 hours, this is what I mean, this is what I mean when it becomes dangerous, if after 36 hours you haven't identified it, then you are supposed to have a very small meal and then try again. When you have gotten the hang of finding your hunger, she talks more about food. She says when she fixes herself a plate of food, she identifies the food she likes the most, all the way down to the least. So she finds the most perfect bite of each to take. Let's say like you have a tortilla chip, right? She's gonna hold it and look at it in the sunlight and if it glistens then that's the best chip and she must start with that. Then she takes the best small bite of it and relishes the taste of it. She talks about falling in love with God but she describes a full-fledged affair with food. Like imagine her at a normal brunch, like brunch with people who are not Christian whatsoever and she's just telling you to me it would sound like i don't know god is her main man and then like food is her side chick (laughs) i mean what do you expect from somebody who has been named gwen like can you really expect miracles no no is the right answer as for the religion in the book basically you're supposed to fall out of love with food and into love with god she hadn't accomplished it, but she thinks she did, and calls herself a success story. You gotta love. You gotta love when you can't provide the numbers, and your whole story is like beefing with water, and then you're like, I'm my own success story. Yeah, my man, like, meet you in my fucking head. There is a chapter on how to stop binging and purging. She says, first of all, understand that you don't have a disease. She says that binging and purging is not some disease or obsession. After she just mentioned vomiting up your food on purpose, taking too many fluid pills or diuretics, taking too many laxatives and over-exercising. She does, of course, go into using the diet for children. You know, like what I told you to pin in your head, the whole inspiration coming from her childhood and how her parents have parented her. Well, she says that they need to learn hunger cues and cravings just like the adults. What she means by craving is that when you're legitimately hungry, you need to give your body what it craves. So kids are to be taught that all food is okay, but they need to learn what their body is craving. 
Therefore, it needs that and can choose accordingly. She says the dessert should never be used as a reward for eating dinner. While it's up to you to choose, you can include dessert choices with the rest of the meal if you want. Once they realize the power struggle is over, you will get positive results. Or you can offer it as an option for later, if they get hungry again. There is even the section in this book about pets. Yes, apparently she is now also a veterinarian. Like, she has multiple degrees. She's just not qualified whatsoever. Apparently, according to Dr. Gwen here, it's perfectly acceptable and even healthy to give your dog and cat table scraps, so human food, along with their regular food. This, I don't even have to tell you. I don't have a pet, but this is just a logical no-go. Like, they're pets. They can't eat human food. But she says that cats are not picky eaters. And even they will refuse food if it's monotonous. Like, don't give cats boring food, according to fucking Gwen. All of her pets have always been healthy and not overweight at all. The whole point of the section is that she wants to give you a reason to get food off of your plate, but not into your own mouth. I'm going to go out on limb here and say that Gwen herself has never raised a cat or a dog, or possibly her family had pets when she was growing up. First, Jeannie will let you know that cats are picky about everything, especially their food, but not in the way that Gwen thinks. Jeannie has had animals all her life and has raised many from birth to death. Cats don't do well with change, specifically change to their food. If you try swapping it out, even for one that's better for them or expensive, chances are extremely low that they will eat it with no hassle. Now, cats and dogs both absolutely love table scraps or human food. But any vet will tell you that it's not healthy and never advised for you to feed them human food. Some human foods can make them sick or worse, and overall it's not balanced with the animal in mind. In 1999, Gwen created her church, Remnant Fellowship, and for the first few years the services were held in a warehouse. Her husband, David, had his master's degree in divinity, and although he never used the degree as a minister, he was one of the original founders of this church. Over time, some things change in the church. The one thing that doesn't is Gwen's place. In her new church, she would appoint many leaders, all of them male and all of them white. She would give all sermons, though, which was a big break from where she had started, which was in a church where women couldn't even hold the checkbook. In the year 2000, at a festival called the Desert Oasis Gathering that was held in a huge stadium in Nashville, Gwen would denounce the Holy Trinity. In Christianity, there is the belief in something called the Holy Trinity, which consists of three things. God, who is the Father Jesus, who was his Son, and the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, which lives inside each person. For a Christian to deny the Holy Trinity is a blasphemy. It's the equivalent of religious treason. It wasn't just the people at the gathering that got this news. It was also included in the weekly newsletter that went to all of the churches worldwide that covered Gwen's curriculum, all of her followers everywhere. This is part of what it said. As a ministry, we believe in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. However, the Bible does not use the word Trinity. And our feeling is that the word Trinity implies equality in leadership or shared lordship. It is clear that the scriptures teach that Jesus is the Son of God and that God sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not send God anywhere. God is clearly the head. Of course, this news was not received well. Customers started calling in to the way down's phone lines and complaining. Religious leaders were pissed. And they started removing Gwen's courses from their churches and returning all the curriculum. Many employees quit and her publisher pulled her books from publication and cancelled the release of her next one called Out of Egypt. What Gwen had done, she had positioned herself between her followers and God. Many times from now on to the end of her life, she will be asked if she considers herself a prophet or if her followers consider her a prophet. 
And the public answer is always, I don't know what my gift is, something along those lines. But privately, she absolutely knew her followers considered her a prophet, and that is exactly what she wanted. Starting in 2001, five separate employees sued Gwen essentially for religious reasons. She had started by suggesting people that worked for her should attend her church. She offended plenty with this, but one woman named Tonya had been recruited from California to work for Waydown, so she moved her family there, thinking that it would be a great opportunity for them. Almost immediately, she was pressured to join Remnant Fellowship, so her family tried it for two months before deciding that they just didn't like it. Tonya said Gwen would tell us grace isn't the message of God, and that she is a prophet. She said the Antichrist resided in each of us. Tonya states, though, that she was fired for praying at work. She said she used her lunch hour to pray, but Gwen stopped her, saying, she pays people good money to pray, and she didn't need my prayers. And it wasn't my place to decide what to pray for. Shortly after that, she was fired. Her attorney later had taken on four other women that were fired from work at Waydown, where they were outreach counselors on the phone lines because they refused to switch to her church. That lawyer was Gary Blackburn, and a few years later he deposed Gwen for one of the lawsuits. At one point during the height of way down, Gwen would say, when people were in prison camps and ate less food, they lost weight, all of them. The interview here had seemed just stunned, and asked, Mrs. Shemblin, you certainly aren't making a comparison between the forced starvation of a population and middle-class Americans' eating habits, are you? Are you honestly doing that? To which she replied, I have been for 15 years, and a lot of people responded. While researching this case, I happened upon a divorce decree that the Remnant Fellowship was heavily mentioned in, and it made me wonder how many stories just like this one were out there. This was a case of a couple that had been married for 17 years, and they had two sons, age 9 and 13. They were divorcing for normal reasons, after years of screaming at each other. The wife was religious, but had struggled with weight loss her whole life. The husband wasn't as religious, and he had tried for years to get the wife to explore having a threesome. Now, the wife wasn't interested in that. When she found out that the husband had cheated on her, she dragged their older son with her in the husband's work to confront him publicly. When she finds out about the second time, she took both her sons with her once again to his work. I'm sure she thought she was embarrassing her husband, and she certainly was, but she was also humiliating her young sons in the process and alienating them from their father. Apparently, the husband had also hired sex workers to come to the family home when his family wasn't there. And eventually, he told the wife, though I'm not sure how or why. So, the husband was also looking at porn online using the family computer, and his young sons used this computer as well, and they found it. So, the husband, when he lost his temper, would yell at the boys and call them names. The wife here would sound like a safer choice during a divorce proceeding, right? No, except when the husband filed for divorce, he was asking for full custody. You see, his wife was religious, right? So he felt, the husband, like he had to get his kids away from the harmful effects of the Remnant Fellowship Church. The boys, by this point, completely blamed their dad, and more so for the divorce because their mom had told them flat out that dad was just a sinner who needed to come down to their church. She didn't even want a divorce. She wanted him to come to the remnant, and he had already heard enough. Even he was calling it a cult. The boys were soccer players. The oldest had qualified to play soccer in the Olympics, one of the top 11 boys in the United States. But when there was a church gathering or church services, the mom had several times skipped taking the older one to soccer commitment. If you were to ask the son, he would say it was his choice. And he probably did say those words. But as you'll soon find, remnant requires 100% obedience. 
even of the children of the people that are following her. That is why the dad filed for divorce. He was terrified of his wife taking the boys to her church. Now, Jeannie read the whole thing, and honestly, the dad was losing the family home, which was expensive. The whole thing made everything financially harder for the husband. He could have stayed with her and kept cheating. And we are not saying that he's the father of the year, but peeking ahead, and he kind of seemed to have done a good thing, insisting on this divorce. The boys had a therapist, a court evaluator, and a guardian at Lytham. Each of these people taking care of these boys would say that they had seen the signs that the boys were very rigid in their thinking. That they were losing the ability to be individuals, to have like individual thoughts, and had total belief in and support of the remnant. While they went to their mother more for nurturing, just because of how the dad's personality was, they also followed and almost mimicked her words. What I had the insight into is that the church requires all children to attend the services, the grown-up services, because there is no Sunday school. There is no baby daycare where the unruly toddlers are taken. Even babies must behave, but we'll get more to that in a bit. The court was left with a hard choice. The husband was asking for full custody, and the wife was asking for joint. The court chose joint custody, and that made everything a two-parent decision. The parents had actually made wise and informed decisions together prior to this, and the court was forcing them to do this again. I won't go into everything that was outlined in these divorce papers, but it was agreed by the courts no remnant for the boys at all. The main reason for the last bit was that every counselor had agreed that the remnant imposes strict obedience and boundaries over the need to allow the children to grow through self-expression and exploration. By the way, this family lived nowhere near Tennessee. They were in Upper New England and the wife went to a satellite church of sorts that met in Hampton, Connecticut at the family house where there were two other children. So the children being required to sit and behave through sermons extends all the way through. This is not something where they're at church, so they have to behave. Whereas if they were at home, perhaps you'd have them in another room. No, if you are in remnant fellowship, even as a child, there are the rules. This was an entry from the mom's church notebook, where she wrote down parts of the sermon from that week. We want the Holy Spirit and God developed in the kids, not self-developed. God esteem, not self-esteem. Teach them deaf to self at an early age. Those words came directly from Gwen Shamblin Lara. She is the only person to ever give a sermon for the church. The church paid the wife's legal fees. The husband's had been over $300,000. So I'd bet hers were too. But they want those kids. Gwen got tired of temporary meeting places, so she finally built a church on 40 acres of land in Brentwood, Tennessee. Brentwood is an incredibly affluent neighborhood just outside of Nashville. And when the church was built, the population was around 25,000. Just a few miles down the road, she had also bought a house. Well, actually, it was called Ashtown, and it was a pre-Civil War plantation set on 25 acres. As a church, they were a non-profit. However, it was not long before, under the same umbrella, there were several different businesses. The members of the church were strongly encouraged to use remnant businesses when they could. Those businesses now were fully staffed by members. They had a dentist, they had a chiropractor, primary care provider that were not listed under the tax-exempt side. But it was Gwen's goal to make them completely self-sustaining. So we are talking like, do not leave the premises. You have everything that you need here. The members described the church as a place where everyone was always happy, and you certainly had no reason to be sad. Members were not allowed to be depressed, and they certainly were not allowed to take antidepressants. Instead, they were supposed to bring all their worries to God. Any concerns a member had, this would apply to the women, they were supposed to take to the section leader, one of the men 
that ran the day-to-day business that concerned the members. They knew, of course, that the man in charge of them would take whatever they said directly to Gwen. The members that were male were, of course, able to handle any concerns on their own. The women of the church, I was going to say wives, but considering the entire congregation all attended the same exact sermons, were taught that it was their job to submit to God, Gwen, and then their husbands. The idea of a non-traditional relationship was not even a question, because in their church a woman was supposed to marry a man and then leave all decisions up to him. As a matter of fact, a wife was only allowed to ask her husband something one time, and whatever his answer was, that was the end of the discussion. Husbands would even threaten to tell on their wives if they didn't behave, and the wives knew if their husbands called the man of the church in charge of them. They'd have to answer for it. I couldn't find anything on what the punishments would be, only that the female members were certain if they incurred the wrath of Gwen, they would find out. Also, within the ranks of female members, they were taught to tattle on each other. So a woman could not even confide in a close friend, because all her friends were a remnant. There was a true isolation for the group, because outsiders were not meant to be trusted. If a woman from outside the church joined and she was married, she was expected to have her husband join her. They wouldn't turn the woman away, but they would push very hard to get the house in order. Another belief that fell under this was that to be closer to God, you needed to be thin. So the thinner you were, the more devout you were. And this will, of course, and unfortunately, include children. When it comes to the children, the prevailing belief was that obedience was the most important thing. They were all homeschooled through the Remnant Homeschool Co-op programs, one of their businesses. And discipline in behavior, as well as diet, was emphasized. Besides the fact that parents were told to spank the children with their hands and, if necessary, use items to make them cry until they learn to behave, the children did not go to daycare and were only kept by remnant members as babysitters. The only time that the children of remnant had outside sitters was the yearly festivals, when the national membership would make the trip to Brentwood. It's not that the children were never looked after by someone else, but because the church believed in the authority line doctrine, anyone over the age of nine was considered a suitable person to look after your child, if only for a few minutes. What I mean by authority line is Gwen outlined for the congregation that God is above all. Then her as a prophet of the Lord, then the husband, then the wife, and finally the kids. So it made it much easier to suggest that a member would need to ask permission to have family visit, go to a funeral of a family member, take a new job, buy a new car, and the list goes on. If a mom did have to go out of town for a couple of days for a very important reason, the children stayed with and were watched by a remnant family that the parents considered friends. But remember, those same parents would be disciplining your child the way the church taught them to. One mom said she went out of town for a few weeks, and when she got back, she knew that her children had been beaten, that they had been spanked, and they seemed like different children that she left. If you're listening to this thinking like, okay, yep, this is going to go downhill very quickly, it does, but again... Even though this story was clearly connected to the case that I'm about to tell you about, nothing really fucking happens. I know, I know that I shouldn't be spoiling it before even telling you the story, but it's just such a mistake. So on October the 8th, 2003, Sonia and Joseph Smith of Atlanta were arrested and charged with murder of their middle child, also named Joseph, when he died after they'd locked him in a trunk. Apparently... Eight-year-old Joseph was incredibly disturbed, less than a year before his death. He had hidden a knife under his bed and threatened to kill the baby of the family. Now, we don't know if he was disturbed because of the beatings or not, because his body was a roadmap of previous injuries. 
The beatings were all not just suggested, they were decrees set down by the Prophet. Children had to obey, remember I touched on that a bit earlier. A teenage girl who lived in Brentford had met the Smith family when they were in town for yearly remnant gathering, and she remembered them. She specifically remembered young Joseph. She was paid to watch a large group of the children over Easter weekend of 2003, so around 20 kids, and she had two friends with her. They paid well, so she thought it would be fun. She said that one afternoon the adults were going into the main auditorium, and she noticed Joseph by the wall. He was just crying a bit, so he wasn't throwing a fit or anything like that, but she saw his dad walking by, and she asked, was basically like, is there a certain toy, is there anything for me to pacify this kid? Instead, the dad punched his fist into the palm and said, just hit him hard, kind of showing her how it's done. She seemed kind of shocked and said, no, sir, I'm not comfortable disciplining your child like that. He just repeated the action and said, just hit him hard. So she tells him she will not be hitting his son. She's not comfortable with it. And then Joseph walks over, takes him into a side room. And clearly he must have hit his child in this room. Because when the two of them came back, the son was crying, but was quiet about it. This babysitter never babysat Remnant again and didn't give it much thought until she saw the parents on the news being arrested for the murder. She and her mom reached out to the police to tell them what she had witnessed. After the two were arrested, the investigators were given a tip, then phone calls were recorded, and the person had witnessed an exchange between Gwen and Sonia, the mother of the child, that the officers needed to listen to. So the FBI and local officials served a search warrant on Remnant Fellowship and were able to find the phone call in question. On the tape, you can hear that Sonia called and spoke to Gwen. It's not evident if the phone call was about Joseph originally, but she does talk about him. And she mentions Ted, that would be Ted Anger, the leader appointed by Gwen and is still in the position today. Now, Sonia says that she took Ted's advice and she locked Joseph in his room from Friday to Monday after emptying his room and she left him there with only his Bible. What I read from that is no food and water, okay? So she says that was great advice. And then Gwen says that's a miracle. You've got a child that's going from just bizarre down to in control. So I praise God. We are spoiling these kids. We are ruining their lives by even letting them think about themselves at all. So thank you, Sonia, for sharing that. Unfortunately, this did not rise to the level of something that authorities could act on. Several people from the church, including Gwen and Ted, made a trip to Atlanta for the trial. They also covered lawyers' fees for the couple and created a website, thesmithsareinnocent.com, which is maintained to this day. One big thing present in this case was the scars on Joseph, on his arms, legs and bottom. They were from a glue stick, let me explain. So, we talked a bit about discipline and the followers of the church were told, in no uncertain terms, when the child misbehaved, they were to spank them until they cried. If they didn't cry, they were not doing it hard enough. One mom found it hard to spank her child that hard, so she went to Gwen for guidance. Another mom had suggested using a longer glue stick, like you would a whip. This would be the long skinny ones that look like clear vacuum cards, but thicker and flexible. She had gone to Gwen for advice, but also permission, because they must ask, even for something like this. She said Gwen tested it out, and she tested it out on her own arm, leg, hand, and said it did kind of sting. So she handed it back to the mom and said she should try it again. This mom went home that day and spanked her child with a glue stick. She swore she'd never use it again. Do you remember now when I mentioned the unruly toddlers and church service? Yes, it was even used for them. Those parents were told by their prophet to beat their children into submission. 
And they weren't just told, right? It's like these cult things know how to brainwash these parents. They are guilted into it. Do you not love your child enough? Do you not care about their eternal soul? Or are you too selfish and lazy to teach them obedience? Apparently, the night that Joseph had died, he had been closed in wicker basket, but he kept popping his head in and out of it. So they shut it forcefully on his head and wrapped bungee cards around it. It wasn't solid since it was wicker, and it did have openings where small amounts of air could get in. The cause of death was either blunt force trauma to the head or asphyxiation or both. The blunt force trauma was from slamming the basket closed before his head was all the way down. And the asphyxiation may have been from the position of his body, not allowing him to take in enough air. His autopsy photos show pictures of scars from the strikes from the glue stick. The investigator had been given a tip about the glue sticks being used to whip Joseph. So he had taken one over to the morgue and was able to clearly match up the scars with the outline of the glue stick that was used. Sonia and Joseph were convicted of one count each of felony murder, reckless conduct, and false imprisonment, three counts of aggravated assault, and four counts of cruelty to children, two specifically pertaining to glue sticks and others to unknown objects. They were sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years. It is unclear still how much Gwen knew about the evidence the investigation had uncovered at the time of the trial. But a few years later, when she and Ted are interviewed by the local news station and they play the tape for her, she repeatedly says the tapes were messed with or altered because the conversation did not happen like what was on the tape. It's clear that due to the allegations that the church had promoted corporal punishment, they were ready to defend against her. She said that enemies of the one true church had made up lies about them because it was the real deal, and they knew it. Any time an article or comment pops up with anything negative about her or the church, she says the same goddamn thing. This is something that is called a persecution complex, and it's common in cult leaders. They always say that people are out to get them as opposed to how leaders usually act when in the middle of a scandal, you will find how Gwen acts is much more aligned with a cult leader. Despite of actual connections of child abuse to the cult, there's still no consequences for this woman at this point in time. Gwen's life was about to change around 2015 when she would meet a man who will become her Next husband, her husband number two. So remember the Holy War saga on the top of that story, right? Like how they're disavowing divorce. It's actually like in their scriptures, tenures, whatever the fuck they're called. Well, apparently it doesn't, the rules just don't apply to Gwen. Because San Diego-born Joey Lara walks into her life. This guy is best known for his acting and modeling career, and most notably he played the role of Tarzan in the series Tarzan, The Epic Adventures, between 96 and 97. Now, Joey quit his acting after 20 years in the industry, around 2002, right? And he starts pursuing a career in country music. And in this HBO documentary that I have watched, which... By the way, it's one of the best documentaries I have seen out there. I'm not even going to lie. They, like, play some of his music. And I was like, oh, oh, you, like, immediately get the type. (laughs) It's like the SoundCloud rappers, but, like, country music version of that. So, outside of the performing, and this is something that will become important, he was a certified pilot, having flown since he was 16 years old. Before Gwen, Joey dated an actress called Natasha Pavlovich, which like represent, she's a Serbian, and they were dating on and off between 84 and 2015. So the two of them had a child together. And due to this, the two of them realizing they're not made for each other, they should separate. Well, 
Lara, Joey, decides that he is going to refuse to move. He really loved the place where they were living. But instead, he files a police report in a bid to get the sole custody of his daughter at the time. And he alleges that her mother, so like the Serbian actress, right, Natasha Pavlovich, had sexually abused the daughter. The police investigation later found that Joey was lying and they would eventually officially separate. What followed was a long legal battle over the custody of the daughter, though. And in the end, the judge would rule that the two of them would be granted 50-50 custody, which I don't know how the fuck that works. Like, if somebody was to try to turn your own daughter against you, be like, oh yeah, you abused them, like, how do you grant that person then, like, 50-50 custody? Like, if you're at their house, this is what they're telling them. They're hushing you against the bloody parent. So Natasha planned to appeal the ruling, but then in 2021, a judge ruled that she was the primary parent, giving her the responsibility for her daughter's education, religion, non-emergency medical care, and more. After separating from his wife, Joey would meet Gwen. And this is said that he met her when he was working as a handyman. So... If you remember, like, the remnant thing had, like, multiple businesses, right? So this could be that he had just worked on one of her projects. And that is how the two of them met. And they would end up starting dating pretty quickly and marrying on August the 18th, 2018. This, however, from what I have seen, might have been kept under wraps. And there might have been a reason for that. Because she would only divorce her first husband in 2018, all out of a sudden, and then marry this man later that year. And this decision had, understandably so, angered many women within Remnant Fellowship Church, who had been told that they were not permitted to divorce their husbands, like they had to go to them for a decision, well, rather to Gwen and then hierarchy, you know, like her husband last, even when they had been repeated instances of infidelity. Here, it seemed like Gwen's husband was completely fine. They had been married for, I think, 40 years or so. And suddenly, she just manages to get a divorce. So the vibe, <laughs> if you wish, in this fellowship was uh, that they have suddenly been angered by this decision. And in the documentary, what I get is that the two of them, Joey and Gwen, just kind of start a YouTube channel. It all becomes about them. Gwen was the only person that was doing sermons, that was actually preaching in the church. And now suddenly she just wasn't. She was just leaving it to anybody else. It seemed like the focus for both Joey and Gwen had become giving their followers and fans an insight into this relationship. And if you literally just take a glance, just, you know, watch a video of the two of them online, it becomes very apparent what type of person or what angle Joey might have had here. Joey actually grew up with a wealthy stepfather and reportedly had a history of dating women who had the financial means to support his lifestyle. This is when I told you the story about Natasha, like there was a reason why he didn't want to move out of his great house. Many of the former members of the Remnant Fellowship would claim that it seemed like he was just playing the part of a devout husband in order to have access to his wife's money and her influence. The church even had their own recording studio and this enabled this man to pursue his dream, the country music dream. Now, former members also suspect that Gwen also saw her marriage to Joey as a strategic move that would allow her to finally have a publicly supportive husband by her side. To which I just don't understand how somebody who actually has been married to you for 40 years and has like a degree in divinity doesn't do the trick like isn't like a more preferable choice but sure in the hbo series it is said that the church changed after joy joined it became about the two of them and gwen never had a time for the church herself 
So when I said that the power kind of trickled down, well, it went mostly to Gwen's children. If you remember, she had two kids with David, with the first husband. So as adults, both Elizabeth and Michael have held leadership roles within their mother's church, with Elizabeth actually taking more of a lead role and leading the Remnant Fellowship youth group, and Michael helping to lead worship services and music performances for the church. Elizabeth would also have her four children, and she was married to a man called Brandon. Similar to her, her brother Michael had a wife, and they also ended up having four children. Unlike his sister, though, Michael never really remained super loyal to Remnant Fellowship. He left his mother's church repeatedly throughout adulthood. So he was kind of like on and off. He wasn't really committed. And it was said that he had done so in order to pursue his own music career. In this article that I have seen online, it is also said that this might be due to his own struggles with his mental health, with the multiple infidelities, and also his weight fluctuations, which would have been a big no-no when it comes to his mom's own business. Now, former Remnant Fellowship members say in the HBO documentary The Way Down that Michael felt trapped by the familial obligations to Remnant Fellowship and that his resentment was evident at times. Gwen's leadership of the Remnant came to an abrupt end in May of 2021. It was broadcasted by the NBC that on May the 29th, a plane crashed into Percy Priest Lake around 11 a.m. on that day after taking off from Smyma Airport. There were seven victims on that plane, including Gwen, including Joey, including Brandon, their son-in-law, their daughter's husband, and also including the actors. And it was said that the plane had been flying from Smyma, Tennessee, to a We the People Patriots Day MAGA rally in Florida. Although both Joey and Brandon, so the son-in-law, had pilot's licenses, Joey's medical certification had expired, and Brandon was not certified for the aircraft that they had been flying. According to the documentary, on the day of the crash, Elizabeth had also sent a text message to remnant church members, telling them to be in prayer and be at peace because God is in control and we will not stop moving forward with what God wants with the church. When it comes to the investigation of this plane crash, the limited information that I could find was the time that the plane had taken off. So they had obviously looked at like the communications on the plane with the controller. And it was said that the departure controller instructed the pilot to turn right to a heading 130, but the pilot did not acknowledge the request. And then shortly after, the controller asked the pilot again if he copied the heading instructions, and he repeated 130 Bravo Kilo. Then two minutes later, the report shows that the controller told the pilot to climb and maintain 15,000 feet, but the pilot never responded. The controller made multiple attempts to re-establish connection with the airplane, but there was no further communications. It was also said that the plane was not equipped nor required to be equipped with a flight data recorder or cockpit voice recorder. A recording of the communication between the control tower and the pilot was captured and then it revealed an alarm going off in the cockpit of the plane seconds before it crashed, suggesting that there might have been a mechanical failure in the aircraft that was actually built in 1982. So from what I have seen, there's no clear confirmation like who was the pilot on that day. Was it Joey or was it Brandon, the son-in-law? And they're still investigating. I don't know if there is a full report because the initial news articles state that the investigation is going to revolve around like weather conditions, interactions with air traffic control, which is the only part that we have, and other like environmental factors to see what had actually caused it. So from what I have seen, it seems like mechanical issues were what had caused this crash, and I don't know if it's human error at all, and I don't think we still know who was actually manning 
that plane. So we come to the section where, yet again, with another cult, we discuss what happens to a church here, rather, a cult in some people's eyes, after their founder dies. The documentary on the HBO shows Gwen's daughter Elizabeth taking over the fellowship immediately following her mother's death. Not only did Elizabeth lose her mother and her stepfather in the crash, but also her husband. And she would say on this that she knows a lot of people have wondered how she's doing. And if she's giving up, if she's throwing in the towel after so much has happened to her. She says this is a good question. After so much tragedy, after so much negative media, after so much persecution, after so much loss. She says in the recording in released from 2021, five months after the crash, I never stuck with my mother in starting this church for the praise of man in the first place. So I'm not about to start caring what man thinks now. She has, however, vowed to continue the mission that her mother had set out. But then in the articles, we kind of find out that in the months since, she seems to have been calling the church virtually instead of like going in there in person. And this can be due to grief, right? Like I cannot even comprehend, like regardless of what you believe in, how somebody would feel after in one day you lose your mom, your stepfather and your husband, like what do you tell your kids? Like, it must be to do with that, at least partially. But also, whether it is because of grief or her own devotion to the remnant, she does remain in a leadership role, but she is now listed as one of the many leaders instead of the head of the church. Her brother had also apparently divorced his wife and left the church since the mother's death. Although the website does list weekly services and an up-to-date calendar, the documentary actually does a good job to cast doubt on where this church is headed now, without the head, without anybody to lead it. Production of the documentary wrapped up before the crash, so we don't have much more on who is manning the fort now. However, the church did make a formal statement two weeks before the documentary was to be released. Part of that statement is as follows. Our Christian beliefs, like hundreds of other churches in the United States, are Bible-based. And our church is based on love, care, mercy, and kindness shown to people from all walks of life. If this is true, if there was ever a core to this program, why have the world outside of their community only heard about the connections of this movement to the case, or multiple cases rather, of child abuse? And why do even the direct links to the founder not seem to believe in its mission enough to continue their mother's work? So, I now pass it on to you. What do you think about this organization, this remnant? Is there enough to make you believe that she is connected to the murder of a young child? And how do you stop an organization like this? If people can't be convinced with an expose, truly, what can you do? What can you do to bring an organization like this down? Because I just can't believe that something like this can fly by. Like after, you know, Jeannie had read a book, after I had watched a documentary and have heard her in any single interview. Like this is very much just 90s bullshit, like very tone deaf stuff when we didn't speak about issues like this, when we had like Ellie McBeal and just representation of anorexia on TV constantly and nobody fucking spoke about any eating disorders. But in 2022, like we just have to do better. Like I would like to hope that people have become more woke in a way, like they've waken up to certain things like this. But I don't know if this organization, whatever you want to call it, continues, it is kind of a proof that we didn't, that we didn't really move as forward as we think we have. So you let me know your thoughts and uh, this is your last video, last main episode for the year. And then I will be back in New Year with, again, three other pattern cases. So you, you know the drill, you know the drill by now. 
I think next we are gonna go into cyber crimes. So like three cyber crime cases, then followed by like three others, and then three others, and then three others, with maybe some mini sods if I have the time in between. But you take care of yourself and uh, don't like just buy into any beliefs or any books online, just question shit <laughs> from the 90s and not make it stand, do not make it stand in 2022. It's like certain things, you know, if we left fashion trends back in the 90s, why can we not leave beliefs like this? Just why? Just explain that to me, make it make sense, because it doesn't. If you think about it, think about it, it doesn't. Cool? And that's why it should remain there. And in doing so, in questioning all of these beliefs, you keep making the world, what? A better place? One motive at a time. I miss saying this. I missed saying this so much. Bye, guys. Bye, fuckers.